Hi friends. First, let me just say a quick thank you to everyone who's watched and enjoyed the first part of my Xenosaga retrospective series so far. It means a lot that you'll take an hour out of your day to listen to me talk about an obscure RPG from two decades ago. That being said, I'll move on to the main reason why I'm recording this little audio introduction. In the previous video, I started from the assumption that anyone watching was new to the Xenosaga series, and so made a point to keep spoilers and plot discussion to a minimum. For this video, I can't do that. Xenosaga Episode 2 has, to put it mildly, a lot of issues, and to discuss them adequately, I need to basically go point by point talking about the story of the game from start to finish. All this to say, there are major spoilers ahead, so if you haven't finished Episode 2 yet, you might want to beware before starting this video. Although I'm assuming that anyone watching an hour plus long video on Xenosaga Episode 2 is already a diehard fan of the series who's already finished all three games, but for safety's sake, I thought it smart to include the spoiler warning just in case. Anyway, enjoy the video. And now, our feature presentation. I've never been one to get overly hyped for an unreleased video game. There are a couple reasons for this. For one, I'm just not that kind of person in general, and second, as we've seen time and time again, it's usually when one's expectations are sky high that the final product is the most disappointing. Despite this, there have been a couple times when expectations have gotten the better of me, and I can think of no better example of this than with the release of Xenosaga Episode 2. Xenosaga Episode 1 is one of my favorite video games of all time. Hopefully everyone watching this has already seen my enormous retrospective review of that game, but in case you haven't, here's a link to check that out. For the sake of brevity, what I'll say is that that game was one of the few that I've played that showed me what storytelling in video games was capable of. Here was a game with the cosmic pretensions of 2001 A Space Odyssey, the epic scope of Asimov's Foundation series, the presentation of a high-budget mech anime, and the psychological profundity of an existential novel. Basically, Xenosaga pushed every one of my buttons as a fan of not only video games, but of storytelling in general. And to say that I was hyped for its sequel is an understatement. When previews of Episode 2 were featured in Game Informer magazine in late 2003 or early 2004, I read and reread those articles like a zealot. I must have watched the game's pre-release trailer dozens of times. I have no evidence of this, but I'm almost certain that it was the first game I ever pre-ordered. I had to wait a little while to experience it for myself. While the game dropped in June of 2004 in Japan, it wouldn't hit American shores until February of 2005. But when it did, I rushed home from school and picked it up from the store, eagerly awaiting to relive that same sense of wonder I had experienced from the first game. And then... something unexpected happened. I felt it almost immediately into my first playthrough, as I traversed the tutorial dungeon. The game wasn't giving me that same feeling that Episode 1 did, not by a long shot. But I pushed it out of my mind. It was still early in the game, and besides, wasn't it unfair to expect it to reach the same heights as what had already become one of my favorite games of all time? So I kept playing, and, well, the feeling didn't go away. On the contrary, it kept growing, and now, over 15 years later, it's stronger than ever. I'm not alone in feeling this way. Among fans of Xenosaga, Episode 2 has always been the black sheep of the franchise. But let me be perfectly clear. Xenosaga Episode 2 is not merely a disappointment when compared to Episode 1. Xenosaga Episode 2 is an unmitigated disaster. This is a game whose every major creative decision seems to be the absolute wrong choice. This is a game whose failure should be measured on the same level as other legendary bad video game sequels like Devil May Cry 2. Yes, it's that bad, and this video is my attempt to explain how a franchise that began with such limitless promise ended up producing one of the all-time biggest bombs of the RPG genre. Strap yourself in, folks. It's gonna be a long one. Now, before getting to the game itself, I need to address the fan perception that surrounds it. As I previously mentioned, Xenosaga Episode 2 is not a very popular game in the RPG community, and because of that, a sort of myth has developed that purports to explain why it fell so far from the heights achieved by Episode 1. 
I want to start by examining this myth in detail, as criticism of it will, I think, be the most valuable resource available for understanding why the game is such a failure. The basic version of the myth plays out like the platonic ideal of the executive meddling trope. The story goes that Episode 1 did not set the world on fire as Namco thought it would. Because of that, producers at the company made wholesale changes to Xenosaga's development team, including removing series director Tetsuya Takahashi and his wife, chief scriptwriter Kaori Tanaka. New talent was brought in to make the series more accessible going forward. These changes were received poorly, and the decision was ultimately made to end the series prematurely with Episode 3. So as an explanation for Episode 2's failures, this myth actually has quite a bit going for it. For one, Xenosaga as a franchise is astonishingly esoteric in its subject matter, with references to psychoanalysis, existentialism, Gnosticism, and Kabbalah that aren't merely used as throwaway set decoration. It seems like a game that really wouldn't hit it off with a wide audience. Furthermore, Namco's decision to shake up the development team falls in line with the decisions of other big-name publishers and developers when their IPs underperform. And finally, the entire story seems like history repeating itself when it comes to how Takahashi and Tanaka were treated during the making of Xenogears. The received wisdom concerning Xenogears development states that the higher-ups at Square, eager to put more resources into Final Fantasy VIII, took those resources away from the Xenogears development team, which resulted in the tragically unfinished state of the game's second disc. To fans, this was one more example of a heartless corporate juggernaut standing in the way of creative vision, with Takahashi once again taking the fall. The myth rehabilitates his status as an auteur, while shifting the blame for Xenogears onto a cold-blooded conglomerate. Given all that, it's not surprising that the myth surrounding Xenosaga Episode 2 took off as it did. There's just one minor problem. Very little of it is actually true. Let's start with what's probably the most widely believed aspect, that Xenosaga Episode 1 was not a commercial success. As far as I can tell, this idea originated from an unnamed developer quoted in an interview with Dengeki, who stated, Yes, the sales have been disappointing, but we promise we will never forget the fans. Unfortunately, I don't know the full context of this statement since, as far as I know, the full interview has never been translated into English. It's possible he may have been comparing its sales to Xenogears, which did sell more copies in Japan than Xenosaga did, but that's just a guess. In any event, this idea of Xenosaga being a commercial flop became about as inseparable from the Xenosaga brand as its anime robot girls and hour-long cutscenes. Most people who discuss the game will inevitably mention that failure. Case in point, in 2020, Kotaku published a massive article outlining the history of Monolith Soft. The article was very well constructed and helped me out immeasurably during the writing process for these videos. But even that article, as valuable as it is, parrots the failure narrative as well. The truth of the matter is that regardless of what that unnamed dev was talking about in the Dengeki interview, he was wrong. However you look at it, Xenosaga Episode 1 was a commercial success. This is easy to see based on how Namco supported the game for years after its initial release. In 2004, they released Xenosaga Freaks, a bonus disc that featured a number of minigames, an expanded encyclopedia, and a demo of the soon-to-be-released Episode 2. The following year, they commissioned Toei Animation, the studio responsible for the anime adaptations of One Piece and Dragon Ball, to create a 12-episode anime series based on the game. Cosmos ended up becoming an almost unofficial mascot for the company, appearing in cameo roles in a number of unrelated games including Soul Calibur 3, Tales of Vesperia, Super Robot Wars, and Project Cross Zone. This alone suggests the game was not an embarrassment for Namco, for they would not feel the need to provide this kind of support if its sales numbers disappointed them. Those sales numbers themselves prove my point further. Within three days of its Japanese release, Xenosaga Episode 1 topped the charts with sales of over 240,000 units. In Japan, it ended up becoming the 17th best-selling game of the entire year, surpassing even the sales of another Namco game that most among us would assume would have been way more successful, Tekken 4. In the US, in terms of sheer sales volume, it actually performed better than in Japan, moving over 500,000 units, which was enough to give it a re-release under the PS2's Greatest Hits label. A press release from Namco released in 2003 even singled out Xenosaga by name as one title that had been particularly successful internationally. All of this should be more than enough evidence to forever dispel the idea that Xenosaga Episode 1 was a commercial failure. But of course, dispelling that myth suggests something much more complex. 
if the game was not a commercial failure, then there would be no reason for Namco to meddle in the development of Episode 2. Whatever happened to make that game the disaster that it is must be something much more complex and much more tragic. Fans who had been following the series since its initial announcement in the spring of 2001 had reason to suspect that something was amiss after finishing Episode 1. Though the game was a triumph, a significant amount of content appeared to have been cut. Several key words that flashed throughout its first trailer, including Ormus and Ren Le Chateau, would not appear in-game until Episodes 2 and 3, and a few others, including the Book of Splendor and the Four Ancient Texts, would never be mentioned again. The trailer hinted at a duel between Jin Uzuki, Xion's estranged older brother, and the leader of the Utic organization, Commander Margulis, that was similarly missing from the game. The Episode 1 official design materials, a reference work released only in Japan and to this day never given a complete English translation, contains an interview with the staff of composer Yasunari Mitsuda's studio, where they discuss a particularly emotional recording of the folk standard green sleeves, explicitly stating that the song made some sort of major impact on Xion during her childhood. While an instrumental arrangement of green sleeves was included on the final soundtrack, that particular vocal arrangement was not, as were the scenes of Xion's childhood it was meant to accompany. These are just some of the most well-documented examples of cut content, and it's not meant to be exclusive. It would appear that the original draft of Episode 1 had become too large and ambitious to be contained in a single game. An interview with Takahashi conducted in December of 2001 all but confirms this. Considering our capacity, there is no way we could just abruptly make all the story right now. So I think we should just do it gradually. He further clarified this in 2003, stating, With Episode 1, we managed to show only about 20% of the complete scene. What did he mean by this? If you recall from my video on Episode 1, initially Xenosaga was meant to be a six-game series divided into three major story arcs. Each story arc would have been separated by vast stretches of time, with Chaos and Cosmos being the only constant fixtures throughout each arc. Episodes 1 and 2, therefore, would have encompassed that first story arc, so logically this would mean that Episode 1 would have had to cover at least half of that arc for the series to remain on schedule. The fact that it showed only 20% of the complete scene means that just to bring the first story arc to completion would require five entire games, three more than initially planned. As a thought experiment, let's extrapolate on that further. I'm going to assume the most conservative estimate of a two-year development cycle with each game averaging about 20% of its story arc, just as Episode 1 did. Assuming complete consistency throughout the life of the series, and that's a major assumption given the inflated budgets and development challenges brought on by the HD era, even that hyper-conservative estimate would not see the Xenosaga story completed in its entirety until, at the earliest, 2030, meaning that even today, we'd still have to wait at least eight more years for a conclusion. This is absolutely insane, and it should come as a shock to no one that the final product didn't match Takahashi's initial vision. As I mentioned in the previous video, Xenosaga's development team was mostly staffed with recent college graduates, novices to the video game industry, and totally unaccustomed to developing for the then cutting-edge PS2. Takahashi's vaulting ambition would have been difficult to bring to fruition by a team of seasoned veterans, let alone this group of neophytes. This brings up the most painful aspect of the Xenosaga Episode 2 myth to deconstruct. The changes made to the series did not stem from finances, or corporate intrusion, but was rather a direct result of Takahashi's own failure to successfully translate his own ideas to the medium in a realistic way. The most ironic thing about this is that even though executive meddling played no part in Xenosaga Episode 2's development, it still ended up echoing the development of Xenogears, because Xenogears, as it turned out, was not a victim of executive meddling either. In 2017, Takahashi finally revealed what caused the state of Xenogears' infamous second disc, putting to rest years of rumors and speculation. Contrary to fandom orthodoxy, Disc 2 was not caused by Square reallocating funds to the Final Fantasy series. It was purely the fault of his team. At the time, Square set its strict two-year development deadline for all new games, and Xenogears was no exception to that. Apart from the complexity of the story, Takahashi was not content with following in the footsteps of Final Fantasy in terms of graphical presentation. Strongly disagreeing with that series' decision to utilize pre-rendered backgrounds, he strove for full three-dimensional environments that the player could interact with. 
This was largely uncharted territory, not just for Square, but video games in general in the mid to late 90s. And because of this, Takahashi's team, again made up primarily of novices, found it impossible to finish the project in the time Square allotted. Executives at the company suggested releasing the game's first disc on its own, which, as anyone who's played Xenogears will surely tell you, would have been an absolutely terrible idea. Takahashi felt similarly, and so proposed the disc 2 we have today as a compromise. So Xenosaga, as it turns out, is not some tragic anomaly. It's a nearly identical manifestation of what had become a pattern among Takahashi's projects. An inexperienced team, an overambitious story, an attempt to push the graphical boundaries of the day. Every one of Xenosaga's woes has their mirror in Xenogears. As brilliant as we may think Takahashi is as a storyteller, the repeated failures to get his games out in the form that he envisions speaks to his failure as a manager. Now, after Xenosaga Episode 1 was released in its abbreviated form, Namco and Monolith Soft seems to have decided to radically retool the series into something much different than what was originally planned. From the beginning, Namco envisioned a yearly release schedule covering all six games. From this point forward, that plan was abandoned. Much of this remains a matter of speculation, but I envision multiple factors were at play here. The first is sheer length. As mentioned previously, the amount of time needed to complete the story in the manner Takahashi intended would have perhaps taken decades, something neither party may have been willing to invest in. Takahashi seems to spell this out directly. If you want to make a single game, that basically means you need to spend two or three years of your life completing it. However, with the world we're trying to display here, that's really nowhere near enough time. It'd probably take me decades to finish everything if it keeps going like this. The second reason may have been financial. I've already discussed how Episode 1 was not the failure it has been made out to be, but that doesn't mean continuing with the original vision of the series would have made financial sense. The total development cost of that game is reported to have been 1 billion yen. I don't know how many copies a game with that budget requires to break even or turn a profit, but even if Xenosaga exceeded that threshold, it may not have been successful enough to continue releasing the series according to the original plan. So, the yearly release schedule was abandoned, and Xenosaga was never again referred to as a six-episode series from that point forward. In fact, aside from a lone interview with Hirohide Sugiura in Famitsu that mentioned in episode 4, no references were ever made to any episodes beyond three. Instead of the three gigantic story arcs, the series contracted to focus exclusively on what was introduced in episode 1. As far as Xenosaga goes, Takahashi said, the story is mainly about Cosmos and the Zohar. But the most radical change to the future of the series came from the structure of the development team itself. This relates to the final aspect of the Episode 2 myth introduced at the beginning of this video. The myth was right in that the team was rearranged, but this was not done at the insistence of Namco. It was done of Monolith Soft's own accord. Takahashi and Sugiura chose to adjust the structure of Monolith Soft's development teams in order to better foster the development of a new generation of talent. As part of this, Takahashi willingly stepped away from his role as series director. As he explained to Famitsu, when you deal too long with a single project, I feel like it becomes harder to chase after new possibilities. I don't want to limit the Xenosaga series to its current state. Instead, I'd like to explore other genres and other possibilities. This sounds like a positive outlook, but it's clear that underneath the surface, he must have been feeling a deep sense of disappointment and disillusionment. Remember, Xenosaga was the series he established Monolith Soft to create, and to see it unable to come to life in the manner in which he wanted must have been devastating. You can sense how low his morale must have been from this telling statement from the official design materials. There are things that, even if you try to plan for, you'll never be able to express. With games as a form of media, no matter where you set it, you have to make towns and all the little accessories. You end up doing annoying work with games. That's why I don't think it's a good medium for telling stories. I think it's better to call it a media for telling narrative things. Without a doubt, there are things you can't get across in a game. This is a man who had spent his entire career telling stories in video games, who in fact helped bring to life some of the greatest stories ever told in video games, now questioning whether or not that medium could ever be used to tell a story. I cannot imagine how low he must have felt to bring himself to make such a statement. Clearly, he was not in a good place, and perhaps stepping away from the series was the best thing he could have done for his well-being, and to that end, I must respect his decision.
In any case, Takahashi was out, and with him went most of the big names on Xenosaga Episode 1's development team, including composer Yasunori Mitsuda and character designer Kunihiko Tanaka. Also leaving was Kaori Tanaka, and I'd like to take a bit more time to discuss this in detail, as I find her departure to be the most fascinating. Because remember, Tanaka is not just the main scriptwriter of Episode 1, she's also Takahashi's wife, and an equal co-creator of the series as a whole. Now, the circumstances surrounding her departure are highly misunderstood, especially in the West. I've seen some sources suggest that she left of her own accord, and others say that she was fired. The only direct statements from Tanaka herself comes from an FAQ she'd posted to her personal website in 2005, and those statements are extremely fragmentary and obviously coming from a woman dealing with an incredible amount of personal and professional stress. From what I can gather, what happened was that Tanaka's position was one of those handed down to a new generation of developers resulting from Monolith Soft's restructuring. It's as simple as that, although even that simple answer raises a ton of related questions. For one, this means that Takahashi, despite being the architect of the series as well as a corporate officer in Monolith Soft, did not have the authority to dictate the new staff assignments, even if the staff in question was his wife. Before the changeover, Takahashi and Tanaka wrote an entire script for Episode 2. Not an outline, mind you, but a complete script. Aside from the basic story outlines, the new team did not use that script at all, and if Tanaka is to be believed, that team had not spoken to her at all after October of 2002. To quote her directly, Supposedly previous story I wrote in the first episode did not appeal to the new team's taste. I'm working on a freelance basis. If clients say they don't need my work anymore, that's all. No conflicts. No quarrels were there. She says no conflicts, but even in translation you can feel the bitterness and frustration bleed through, and anyone should understand why. A story that obviously meant so much to her and her husband was essentially discarded in favor of a version that only fragmentarily resembled her original vision. Making everything worse was how her departure was reported in the West. Though she apparently had no contact with the new team since October of 2002, for whatever reason, her departure did not reach the ears of Western news agencies until January of 2005, a month before Episode 2 was due to launch in the United States. This had the unfortunate side effect of leading to a number of Western fans inundating her with abuse, accusing her of deserting the series. This is really, really not cool in any circumstance, but especially at that time, because Tanaka was recovering from the after-effects of her brother's suicide in 2003, which had led her to attempt suicide out of grief the same year. Hopefully that clears things up. Again, due to the whole incomplete and fragmentary nature of the information, it's impossible to reconstruct the whole story, and there's still so much that remains unanswered. Takahashi and Tanaka's response to the shift in development are, to my ears, as different as night and day. Takahashi seems to have given into melancholic resignation, while Tanaka seems venomous to the core. And remember, the two are a married couple, so I can't help but imagine how this must have impacted their relationship. Tanaka actually addressed this in her FAQ, stating that it was peaceful and requesting her readers not to pry, so I suppose that's as good enough a reason as any to leave the subject behind and move on. I've been going on for a while about Episode 2's new development team, but I haven't, as of yet, talked about specifically who they are. I'll go over the others a bit later, but right now I want to mainly focus on the director and scriptwriter. Episode 2's new director was Ko Arai, who had worked with Takahashi since the Xenogears days. Here's his profile on the back pages of Perfect Works. On that game, he was credited as Chief Artistic Design, while his role in Xenosaga Episode 1 was Map Planning Director. Replacing Tanaka as scriptwriter was Norihiko Yonasaka, who was credited on Episode 1 as a quest scenario writer. Aside from his work on Episode 1, Yonasaka was himself a veteran of the RPG industry, acting as both writer and director for several entries in the Ark the Lad and Front Mission franchises. Arai described his and Yonasaka's roles in relation to Takahashi's as akin to adapting a screenplay out of an original work. Takahashi supplied the story outline, while the two of them arranged it into a full script. There's a major red flag concerning all this, though. As I've mentioned time and again, Xenosaga is an incredibly complex, personal story that's in many ways inseparable from the couple who created it. It's an auteur work par excellence, and to do it justice, a new team needs to be led by people who not only respect Takahashi and Tanaka's vision, but, on a much more basic level, understand that vision almost as well as they do. 
and the amount of people in the world who can lay claim to those requirements are almost non-existent. All this to say, there was a reason to be concerned for the leadership of this new development team. Arai may have been working with Takahashi since the Xenogears days, but as far as I'm aware, Episode 2 is only his fifth credited game and his first directorial effort. As for Yonasaka, he more or less admitted that he didn't understand the story he had just been assigned to adapt. I feel that the world of Xenosaga is something deeper than just fantasy. I still don't understand all of it, and I think it might take me years to arrive at Takahashi's level of insight. This is not at all what one wants to hear from the chief screenwriter of a Xenosaga game, and the final product absolutely reflects his anxieties. So with all that in mind, I think it's finally time to take a deep dive into the game itself, and begin to dissect what makes Xenosaga Episode 2 such a disaster. One of the reasons why Episode 2 feels so disappointing is because it tricks you into thinking that it's going to be good. The opening dungeon is probably the most satisfying part of the entire game. Rather than beginning right where Episode 1 left off, the opening scene of Episode 2 is an extended flashback, focusing on a descent operation during the Milshin conflict featuring returning protagonist Chaos and newcomer Kanan, a mysterious Realian who becomes a major supporting character for the rest of the series. This is a great idea, it gets the audience reintroduced into one of the series' major plot threads, focuses heavily on action, and gives the team an opportunity to test off the new graphical engine. I don't know if they're using a different engine than the one they used in Episode 1, or if they just heavily refined that old one, but it looks fantastic. Gone are the stiff animations that characterized Episode 1. Episode 2 feels flashier and more dynamic overall. But best of all, Episode 2 brought back what I was sorely missing from Episode 1, mech dungeons. In fact, the very first dungeon of the game is a mech dungeon, and I'd say a good third of the rest feature mechs as well. And these mech dungeons feature a brand new battle system that I actually quite enjoy. As opposed to the eggs you piloted in Episode 1, Episode 2 has your characters piloting ES units, unbelievably powerful machines controlled by two people and powered by the mysterious anima relics. You only have three units between your party, and only two are able to be used in combat at any given time. Admittedly, you aren't able to customize your units to the degree that you could in Episode 1, but you can switch the unit's co-pilot. Doing this gives you access to a number of unique special skills, depending on who that co-pilot is. Special skills are performed by expending a certain amount of energy charge, or EC. Every normal attack raises your unit's EC gauge, and you can choose to stock to raise it significantly higher. Once you hit either 100 or 200 EC, you can perform a special attack. Outside of specials, one of your units, the ES Zebulon, has the unique ability to use Aether skills, which makes it invaluable for healing purposes. This is admittedly a simple system, but I've always found it satisfying, and the simplicity never bothered me. The mech portion of the dungeon ends at about the halfway point, giving you the opportunity to get used to the regular combat system, which I will get into later as I have way too much to say about it here. By dungeon's end, Xion's brother Jin comes to your party's aid, and for the first time since that initial trailer for Episode 1, you're given some insight into his rivalry with Commander Margulis. The end point of all this is his delivery of a mysterious set of data which purports to reveal the puppet masters behind the Milshin conflict. Again, all of this is a great way to set up the rest of the game. But even in this admittedly strong start to Episode 2, there are signs of trouble. The prologue features a fair amount of exposition, giving Arai and Yonasaka the chance to demonstrate their grasp of the world's lore. Sadly, it was here that I got the first pangs of unease that the game may not be the masterpiece I hoped it would be. Takahashi and Tanaka's script for Episode 1 was confident, a true demonstration of these masters of world building in action. Episode 2's script, by contrast, lacks that confidence. It uses all the familiar world building terms and phrases from Episode 1, but never truly feels at home there. I've described it in the past like this. Imagine a high school student assigned to write a report about Macbeth. They read the play, but can barely comprehend Shakespeare's language. Maybe they look at the Wikipedia article to supplement the gaps in their knowledge, but that only goes so far. Xenosaga Episode 2 feels like that high school student's report. Perhaps they know the major story beats, but any details above that seem beyond their grasp. If you have time, watch a cutscene from Episode 1, and then immediately watch one from Episode 2. To me, it feels like a measurable drop in quality. But maybe that's to be excused. Like I mentioned a few paragraphs back, the number of directors and writers qualified to adapt Takahashi's story are probably in the single digits, so maybe we should cut them some slack. 
maybe. But even if we grant them that luxury, what can't be excused are fundamental mistakes in direction and tone, and that's exactly what we find as the story proper begins. Setting aside the prologue we just discussed, Episode 2 is a sequel in the most literal sense of the word. The game opens mere seconds after the final scene of Episode 1. For those who haven't played Episode 1 in a while, that game ends with Second Milsha being nearly destroyed by two literal doomsday devices, the Song of Nephilim and Proto Merkaba. Given that, the atmosphere on the planet should be one of extreme fear and anxiety, but that's not what we find. Save for maybe one NPC who references those events, the atmosphere on Second Milsha is way too normal, and it's extremely jarring. This isn't helped by the game's baffling choice of background music for this scene, which I can only describe as bizarre, futuristic hold music. I cannot think of a less appropriate song to play here, and since I've gone ahead and mentioned it, I guess this is as good enough time as any to discuss the soundtrack. To replace Yatsunari Mitsuda, the developers of Xenosaga Episode 2 enlisted the services of two composers, one for the cutscenes and one for the gameplay. The first, who was placed in charge of the cutscenes, was Yuki Kajiura, who is mostly known for her work in anime soundtracks. Today she's perhaps best known for Sword Art Online, or Demon Slayer, but she's been working regularly in the industry since the late 90s, composing for such series as Noir, My Hime, Madoka Magica, and the Fate franchise. Among those in the know, Kajiura is on the same level as luminaries like Yoko Kano, and her work on Episode 2 maintains that high standard of quality. From haunting piano melodies to electronica-tinged action anthems, Kajiura's compositions are some of the only marks of quality in a game that so often lacks them. But her songs aren't the issue here. For that we need to discuss the game's second composer, Shinji Hosoe, who is in charge of most of the gameplay music. This is another unfamiliar name for most of you, but Hosoe has been composing for Namco titles since the late 80s. His credits are extensive, but he's perhaps best known for his work on the Tekken and Ridge Racer franchises. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood. I think Hosoe is incredibly talented. His Ridge Racer soundtracks, for instance, are rightly considered masterpieces. But for whatever reason, he just dropped the ball on episode 2. A big part of that doesn't even involve the quality of the music itself. That song I was talking about a minute ago? The one I described as bizarre, futuristic hold music? I don't think that song is that bad. The issues I have are mostly tonal in nature. Hosoe is primarily an arcade composer, and it follows that most of his tracks sound like they come from a mid-90s arcade game. The problem is that tone is completely inappropriate for the Xenosaga franchise, which generally calls for emotional, epic, and somber music. This clash of tone is further highlighted when his songs are placed alongside Kajiura's, a 2009 interview with Kajiura revealed that her and Hosoe did not meet a single time throughout the development of Episode 2, and listening to their work side by side really drives that point home. As a comparison, here's a track from Kajiura and here's one from Hosoe. To me, these tracks sound like they were composed for two different games. Kajiura's song complements well the tone that Mitsuda established in Episode 1, while Hosoe's sounds like the farthest thing from that tone. This enormous contrast served to better emphasize the flaws in Hosoe's compositional philosophy, and it will come as a surprise to no one that his contributions were not well received on either side of the Pacific. The reception was so bad that the one soundtrack released from the game was subtitled Movie Scene Soundtrack, and featured exclusively Kajiura's compositions, while nothing from Hosoe. To this day, I don't think any of Hosoe's songs have been released commercially in any form, which is unheard of for a collaborative soundtrack of this kind. Although if you want, someone has uploaded all of his music onto YouTube, and I'll provide a link to that if you're really interested in hearing it. So I'm recording this segment after I'd already begun editing the video, and that's because I've discovered the soundtrack situation surrounding Episode 2 is crazier than I initially thought. First, there's perhaps a third composer who worked on the soundtrack, Ayako Sasso, who's been Hosoe's songwriting partner for decades. I say perhaps because the credits for many of Episode 2's songs are woefully incomplete, 
meaning it's impossible to know which songs were done by Hosoe, which were done by Sasso, and which were collaborations. Second, I claim that all of Hosoe's music has been released on YouTube, and I've found out that this isn't entirely correct. A lot of it has been, but I've discovered a shocking amount that's still unavailable in any form. Case in point, there's a particularly bad song that plays during a scene focusing on Xion and Jin, and I was going to play that song in the background of this video when discussing that scene, but I can't do that because I cannot find a version of the song anywhere. I had to basically let the audio play directly from the cutscene, so I apologize in advance for what's certain to be awkward audio editing around that part of the video. And finally, it turns out the soundtrack for the Japanese and American releases of the game are, in some ways, completely different. There are several scenes in the Japanese release that use Hosoe's songs, and when the game was released in the West, those scenes had that music replaced or, in several cases, cut altogether. The Xeno series wiki actually has a surprisingly detailed write-up of the soundtrack for the game, so I'll go ahead and provide a link to that in the description if you're interested in reading more. Alright, back to the show. Insane as it is, you barely have time to process the sheer ineptitude of the tone when the game throws you into what is possibly the worst car chase sequence in the history of art. Literally everything about it is wrong. The music, again, feels too upbeat for the tone the scene is going for. The car maneuvers too perfectly, which removes any sense of tension or danger the characters might be in. The rest of the drivers on the road act like nothing out of the ordinary is going on. Which makes you wonder, between their planet being nearly annihilated by proto Merkava and their cities being invaded by the Utic organization, are the citizens of Second Milsha really phased by anything? Worst of all is we're never given a proper introduction to Richard and Herman, the villains in pursuit of the party. Because of that, we aren't aware of the stakes involved in the chase. I honestly have no idea why the staff put this in the game at all, as it doesn't add anything whatsoever to the plot. It seems to me that it exists solely to add an extra dungeon to the game's first disc, and to give the opportunity to show off more of the new graphical engine, which is completely unnecessary seeing as how the tutorial dungeon accomplished that just fine on its own. And even if the scene looks nice, I was never fully able to appreciate the series' new look because of the changes made to the character designs. I honestly don't know who's to blame for this, as there are four people given design credits, but in any case, Episode 2 decided to deviate from Episode 1's anime look, going instead for something more realistic. The new designs, unfortunately, pull vaults squarely over the Uncanny Valley. Almost every character has this creepy doll look that makes them supremely uncomfortable to look at. But what's weird about this is that these changes seem to have been applied inconsistently, depending on the age and gender of the character in question. Adult male characters seem to have had very few changes made. For instance, here's Albedo and Ziggy from Episode 1, and here they are from Episode 2. Very little difference between them. The changes only seem noticeable on characters who are younger and female. Compare the designs of the two main characters, Junior and Xion, between the two games, and you see what I mean very clearly. Characters who are both young and female seem to get it the worst, as you can see by comparing Momo in Episode 1 to Momo in Episode 2. All I can say is wow. So it's clear that the game has a multitude of problems going on right from its opening scenes. But I will admit that it does do one thing right. It seems the staff wanted, to the best of their abilities, to duplicate the pacing of Episode 1, and I'll give them credit for doing a good job at that. Episode 1 is the textbook definition of a slow burn, content with taking its time to set up its massive world and explore its characters. Episode 2, on the first disc at least, replicates this pace well, centering almost exclusively on Momo's analysis at the UMN on Second Milsha. But even there, what Arai and Yonasaka decide to focus on seems misguided and wrongly chosen. Case in point, it's here that Xion and Alan are, supposedly, told the details of the Zohar project, the top-secret joint venture meant to eliminate the Gnosis from the galaxy. I say supposedly here, because the revelation takes place off-screen, with the player witnessing only a brief reaction by Xion after she's told. This is such a baffling decision. The Zohar project was alluded to time and again in Episode 1, but always by characters on the periphery of your party's sphere of influence. Most of your party, Xion and Alan chiefly among them, had no idea to the extent of how much they were involved in the project, so this revelation should be a huge deal, but that's not at all what it feels like. 
What we're given instead is 20 or 30 minutes of Xion's relationship with her brother Jin. Now, in theory, I don't think this is a bad decision. The first game gave us tantalizing glimpses of their relationship, or lack of one, and that relationship is a crux of why those characters are the way they are. My issue is that the game presents it in a tone similar to a B-grade sitcom from the 1980s. You're playing the drums? Man, I give up. What are you trying to say, Xion? Not so loud. <gasps> Xion? And a voice I've heard somewhere before. That music you're hearing now? That's what's playing during these scenes, and of course it's a Hosue track, probably his worst in the entire game. Oh, hi. Long time no see. It feels almost like it's intentionally sabotaging itself, and again, I can't fathom how anyone could think this is an appropriate choice. Eventually, we arrive at the major set piece of the game's first disc, Momo's UMN analysis, and as expected, Albedo sabotages the party, so in order to save Momo and protect the Y data, they need to dive into the Encephalon, just as they did with Cosmos in Episode 1. This is divided into two sections, exploring Sakura's house in the Yuriev Institute, and the massive dungeon called the Subconscious Domain. Both of these, unfortunately, are a slog. The exploration sections hardly require any exploration at all. The maps are small, and most of what you're doing is following phantoms of Albedo, Guinan, and Junior to various areas in order to activate flashback scenes. To add insult to injury, every single time you move to a new screen, the game pauses to show the phantoms running to a new area. This is ostensibly meant to guide the player to their next destination, but because it happens literally every time you enter a new screen, it makes the experience feel incredibly disjointed. And that's a shame, because a lot of those flashback scenes are great, some of the most emotionally powerful in the entire game. I just wish the gameplay around them didn't have to be so annoying. And then there's the subconscious domain, which many fans profess to be not only the worst dungeon of Episode 2, but of the entire series. I don't know if I can agree, I'll put forth my argument for the Ormus stronghold a bit later, but I can absolutely see where they're coming from. It's a huge drag, and the decision to artificially extend its length by forcing your party to run through it a second time during the winter is indefensible. Further, it's in this dungeon that I really felt the strain of the game's combat system, so I think now is a good time to talk about that. On the surface, the system will seem familiar. The turn order bar, boost gauge, event slot, ethers, attacks mapped to triangle and square, all of these returned from episode 1, which, if you'll recall, had a battle system that I liked. But the two play completely differently, and this is due entirely to episode 2's introduction to the break system. The break system, honestly, feels like a cool idea in description. Every attack your party throws is mapped to one of three zones, and every enemy you encounter has a weakness to a specific combination of attacks to those zones. If you attack an enemy with their zone weakness, you've broken them, which weakens their defenses. Further, certain party members can launch the enemy into the air or knock them on the ground, which weakens them further. Boosting while an enemy is broken extends the broken state until you've stopped boosting, which allows for so-called break combos that are devastating in their damage potential. These combos can further be extended by building up your stock gauge, which allows you to perform up to three additional attacks during your turn. Again, this sounds like a cool system in theory, but it completely falls apart in practice. As it stands, the break system completely removes any semblance of strategy from battle. Sure, enemies also have weaknesses that can be exploited, and you can perform special attacks with two of your party members that are called double attacks, which are basically the equivalent of dual attacks from Chrono Trigger, but really, outside of the game's earliest encounters, break combos are the only effective method of dealing damage to your enemies. Damage caused by normal attacks are negligible at best. If you want to win, you're going to have to build your stock, break the enemy, boost, and unleash break combos until they're dead. This takes a lot of time. For most of the tougher enemies, you're going to want to charge up your stock at least two per party member. That's going to require six turns at minimum. And stocking is not like guarding from episode 1, where you get a boost to your defense. No, you're left completely vulnerable to enemy attacks, wasting all these turns for the sole purpose of building up your stock meter. This makes even the most basic random battles, which in other games would perhaps last only a couple seconds, last several minutes. And this isn't helped by the absurd load times you need to sit through every time a battle begins. And don't think that you can easily avoid enemies if you don't feel like fighting, either. 
Episode 2 has basically the same encounter system as Episode 1. Battles are not random, and you can detonate traps that stop enemies on the field while also giving your party bonuses if you decide to engage them. This would all be fine, after all I like this system in Episode 1, if it weren't for the fact that enemy speed on the field has been raised to a level that is borderline unfair. In Episode 1, there was always a delay of about a second before an enemy starts chasing you, and enemy speeds were such that it was usually possible to outrun them. In Episode 2, enemy reaction time seemed to be almost instantaneous, and I found it almost impossible to outrun them once they gave chase. This makes the trap system virtually useless, since my reaction time was usually nowhere near fast enough to detonate the traps before they reached the party. So you're going to be fighting a lot, and the fights are going to drag, and once you reach the subconscious domain, they're going to be straight up unfair. This is a combat system that seems ideally designed for encounters with one or two enemies at most, where you can stock up and focus on breaking one enemy at a time until they're dead. But of course, since this is an RPG, you're going to find yourself in battles with three, four, maybe five enemies at once. Having to spend so much time taking down enemies one by one means that you're going to have to kill three or four more once the first one is dead. And unlike the player, enemies don't need to break your party members. They just hit you hard right from the start. Make no mistake, your party is going to be at such an unfair advantage in these later battles, and the system does not give you any remedies to make them any easier. It just wasn't designed for it. Inevitably, you're going to have to waste even more time in a system that already feels unnecessarily protracted, just keeping your HP at healthy levels. And oh boy, since I brought up HP recovery, you're going to love this. You're also going to have to keep a constant eye on the stock of your recovery items because you cannot buy them in Episode 2. Yes, for reasons that I cannot even begin to understand, the developers felt the need to completely remove money and shops from the game. This means you either have to find your items in the field or win them in battle, and if your play sessions are anything like mine, this means you're never going to have anywhere near enough revives or HP recovery items for most of the game. Not only is this a self-evidently horrible decision that does nothing but add more headaches to a game all too plagued with them already, I also found it completely immersion breaking as well. Consider, your party is visiting some of the most populous, technologically advanced areas of human civilization and they don't have access to a shop? I don't buy it. Beyond this scarcity of items, there's a second consequence to this decision to excise shops and money. No shops means no buying weapons and armor. And no buying weapons and armor means very, very limited opportunities for character customization. In stark contrast to Episode 1's embarrassment of riches, customization in Episode 2 is limited mostly to unlocking and equipping character skills. There's a total of 112 skills available to learn, and every character has equal access to those skills. Admittedly, this does give you a lot of options to customize your characters. As with limited access to skill points, it makes sense to have different characters specialize in different types of skills. But despite that, I don't really like this system for a couple reasons. First, I much prefer systems that cater skill acquisition individually for each character. Having equal access to the same skills make progression seem monotonous, regardless of how many skills are available to learn. Second, and this is most important here, Learning skills really does not mitigate the myriad annoyances and bad decisions at the core of the battle system. I know I've been going on about that battle system for a while now, and at this point some of you may be thinking, well screw all that, the mech battles are a lot more fun, so I'll just grind in my ESs until the characters are overleveled. This would be a good idea if it weren't impossible to do. Your ESs actually have their own levels apart from your characters, meaning that any AXP you win from mech battles apply only to the level of your ESs, not the characters themselves. If you want to keep up with the enemy's levels, you have to fight in normal battles, and there's no way around it. There's one more annoyance that I need to address with this battle system, and it's probably the most annoying aspect I've mentioned thus far. Episode 2 retains the most aggravating trait from Episode 1's combat system, boost cancelling. Even if you boost, enemies can sometimes still boost themselves and cancel your boost in the process, even though you are never able to do the same thing to them. In Episode 1, I describe this as an annoyance. In Episode 2, it's potentially game-breaking. In a battle system that basically requires you to use boost to string together combos, 
The fact that enemies have the potential to cancel those combos at their whim is frustrating beyond words. Now you have to go back and rebuild your stock meter, rebuild your boost, basically start from scratch, while your enemies suffer no repercussions. This is even more annoying during boss fights, as most bosses have break weaknesses that require you to boost just to break them. Needless to say, I hate this battle system. It's probably my least favorite in any RPG I've ever played. It's needlessly annoying and unfairly difficult. And this isn't like Dark Souls, where the difficulty is part of its charm, and the whole reason you play the game is to get your ass kicked and, after endless trial and error, figure out how to proceed. Episode 2 is different, its difficulty is purely artificial. There's no mystery in how you're supposed to win. Even if you don't know an enemy's break weakness right away, that doesn't change the fact that they still need to be broken and comboed in order for your party to win. I've straight up stopped playing the game on several occasions because I was so tired of being torn to shreds by random groups of just random enemies in some of the game's later dungeons, and I guarantee you're going to be tempted to follow suit at some point during your playthrough. So I'm just going to go ahead and stop here because I've spent enough time talking about it as it is, and there's still so much more that we haven't even touched on yet. Eventually, tedious as it is, you'll make it to the end of the subconscious domain. Unfortunately, that doesn't stop Albedo's plans. The pathway to Old Milsha is open at last, and then... the disc ends. Now, this isn't the worst place to end the disc on a narrative level. The opening of Old Milsha is an effective cliffhanger. But in terms of time investment, it's a bit concerning. You can easily reach the end of disc 1 in 10 hours, maybe even less. And this raises a greater concern about the game's length. Episode 2 is a weirdly short game. You can probably reach the end in somewhere between 20 to 25 hours. For the sake of comparison, it took me longer to finish my first playthrough of Chrono Trigger than it did my first playthrough of Xenosaga Episode 2. And Xenosaga Episode 2 is a PS2 game spread over two DVDs, while Chrono Trigger is an SNES game released on a 16-bit cartridge. If you want, you could extend your play session by doing some of the side quests, but even that may cause more irritation than it's worth. Most of the side quests come in the form of the GS, or Global Samaritan campaign. Basically, random NPCs have a problem, and your party, as good Samaritans, solve them for rewards. What this means, for the most part, is light puzzle solving and fetch quests. Lots and lots of fetch quests. As an example, the first quest you have access to requires you to run across Second Milsha, the Durandal, and the Kukai Foundation, delivering letters. And because this is a PS2 game, Fast travel wasn't a standard quality of life feature yet, so you have to go to all these places manually. That basically sets the tone for most of the GS campaign. They're tedious, and they're a huge wasted opportunity. Think of the incredible endgame side quests in Chrono Trigger, how each of them so brilliantly fleshed out your party and expanded the lore of each historical era. Or think of the Bracer Guild quests in The Legend of Heroes, where the characters you encounter will follow your party across multiple games, creating this incredible sense of continuity. The GS campaign is nothing like that. You're literally doing pointless errands for random people you don't know and will largely never see again. The rewards aren't bad, they're mostly keys to unlock higher level skills on the skill tree and segment decoders because the segment address quest is back from episode 1. But at a certain point, I usually just give up on them because they stop feeling worth my time to do. I will say though, if you're unlike me and actually enjoy doing all these GS quests, there are some that can only be done after you've beaten the game at least once, including the Robot Academy, because that's back too. I have to give Monolith Soft credit in giving players some genuine replay value if they want it. Alright, let's end this tangent and return to the topic at hand. Disc 2. Oh boy. Disc 2. So, in Star Trek fandom, there's this phenomenon known as the Odd Number Movie Curse. For whatever reason, the odd-numbered Star Trek movies are almost always considered to be of a lesser quality than that of their even-numbered counterparts. The most obvious example is the second movie, The Wrath of Khan, which has been considered the high watermark of the entire Star Trek franchise since its release in 1982, while the fifth, The Final Frontier, is considered by many to be its low point. I'm beginning to think that there's something similar going on here. A Xeno series second disc curse, if you will. As it seems that every second disc for every game in the series is plagued with issues. 
Episode 1 is the only game spared of this fate, but it's spared by default given that it's only a single disc game. Every other entry in the series, without fail, succumbs to this curse. There's a mountain of discourse written about Disc 2 of Xenogears, including in portions of this very video. Episode 3, though on nowhere near as severe a level as Xenogears, has very obvious pacing issues of its own, which I'll address in its own video. And then there's Episode 2. Perhaps this is a minority opinion, but I think Disc 2 of Episode 2 is worse than Disc 2 of Xenogears. Let me explain. I'm not going to unconditionally defend Xenogears' second disc. It doesn't deserve that, and I would give anything for it to be as fully fleshed out as its first disc. But Takahashi is a master of his craft. Faced with a bad situation, he did his best to present the rest of the story in an appealing way, and I think he pulled it off. It may not be perfect, but I like the presentation of Disc 2 for what it is. Arai and Yonasaka do not share Takahashi's artistic sense, so there's no appealing presentation to be found in Episode 2's second disc. Just atrocious pacing and directorial choices that honestly serve to derail the rest of the game. And these choices start with the very first scene of the disc, which is arguably the worst of the entire series. Xenosaga is, as I've mentioned before, a series that has no problem including cutscenes that can approach or even exceed the 30 minute mark. For me, and I assume most of its fans, that's part of its charm. This first scene of disc 2 totally abandons this. Completely ignoring the first rule of creative writing, show, don't tell, the scene is a hastily thrown together assemblage of events presenting what happens in the aftermath of Old Milsha's reawakening, accompanied by narration of Xion's voice actress in the style of a Wikipedia article that's been flagged as needing additional verification. And yes, I very specifically said Xion's voice actress because, although it's clearly the same woman, it isn't supposed to be Xion as she refers to that character in the third person. I cannot understand why they did this. This style of narration would admittedly be inappropriate anywhere they decided to include it, but there's a serious argument to be made that this point of the story is the worst time they could have chosen to do it. This is kind of where the series has been building since it began. Old Milsha's return from the Abyss, and every faction, hero and villain, is beginning a mad scramble for the Zohar. This, of all scenes, cries out for a slow, deep dive, as had been standard up until this point, but the scene is over in a matter of minutes, and its brevity gives it no opportunity to leave any sort of impact. What's weird is that this is the only scene in the game that's directed in this way, and unlike basically every other cutscene in the game, this one is not captioned. All of this taken together seems to suggest that the team was faced with some sort of developmental problems that necessitated major cuts, but I've never found any evidence to suggest any difficulties occurred at all. On the contrary, everything I've read suggests a much smoother development when compared to Xenogears in Episode 1. Still, between the presentation of Disc 2 and the abbreviated length of the game itself, I can't shake the feeling that something went wrong somewhere, though I don't have any proof to back that up. Thankfully, no other cutscene is nearly as bad as that first one. But the bad decisions do continue, as you can see when you begin the disc's first dungeon, the Damarung. The Damarung was a location that I was looking forward to exploring since its debut in Episode 1. Not only is it the headquarters of Vector Industries, it's an enormous spacecraft, literally the size of a planet. It's also mind-bogglingly powerful. The scene in Episode 1 where it unleashes the Rhine Maiden on a horde of Gnosis always gives me chills. What was that?! Impossible! That isn't supposed to be here!
Now, in any RPG, I understand that it's not practical to explore every square inch of every location you visit. Rendering all of, say, Midgar from Final Fantasy VII entirely to scale would not only be exhausting, but probably technologically impossible as well. But that's not an issue, because video games can use abstraction to present an appropriate sense of scale. Even though I wasn't able to explore every square inch of Midgar, I was still convinced that it was the largest city in its world. Xenosaga Episode 2 completely fails at presenting this sense of scale in its environments. We already got a taste of this in Episode 1. The UMN Administration Bureau, ostensibly one of the most important government agencies in the universe, consists of a small lobby with a few rooms on each side. The Yuryev Institute mostly consists of a single hallway. The Damarong, alas, is the worst example of this. Canonically, it may be the size of a planet, but all you see is a lab, Xion's bedroom, this hallway, and a storage facility. It feels claustrophobic. And it says a lot that the Woglinde, the first real environment you explore in Episode 1 and a ship that the Damarong is meant to dwarf in size, feels orders of magnitude larger. Eventually, you escape the Damarong and rendezvous with your party on the Elsa. The rest of the game can more or less be broken down as follows. Hang out on the Elsa, fly to a dungeon, clear the dungeon, return to the Elsa, repeat. It's a very odd shift from Disc 1. Whereas that discontinued the slow burn introduced in Episode 1, Disc 2 barely gives the plot time to breathe. Actually, it's kind of a worst of both worlds scenario, because not only does it ruin the pace of the story previously introduced, it still finds time to plod the disc with content that it has absolutely no business being in the game at all. The Ormus Stronghold, my vote for Episode 2's worst dungeon, is the worst example of this. It's a purely filler dungeon, and that's even true in the context of the game's story, where it materializes out of nowhere to block the Elsa's return journey to Old Milsha. The encounter rate is out of control. You're constantly engaging with groups of four enemies that will overwhelm your party in a heartbeat, and avoiding them is near impossible. The paths are often so narrow that you're generally going to be forced into an encounter whether you want to or not. There's a mind-numbing vertical maze at the midpoint, and your reward for reaching the end is activating the stronghold self-destruct sequence, which has all the grandeur of an 8th grade science fair project. After that, you fight the dungeon's first boss, who is perhaps the most useless character in all of Xenosaga, Orgula. She appears, literally, in two scenes, once at the beginning of the game for a few seconds, and again immediately before you fight her. Her character is non-existent and borderline pointless. Why she was included in the game at all is a mystery. The dungeon's next bosses aren't any better as you once again encounter Richard and Herman, those utterly forgettable instigators of that horrible car chase scene from the beginning of the game. And don't think you're going to get any illuminating insight into their characters now either. They flee as quickly as they appear. Like Orgula, their inclusion in the game is a mystery, and I don't understand why they weren't just cut entirely. In truth, the game really could have used those cuts. The rest of Episode 2 feels so rushed, so criminally mishandled in its decision to speed through what remains of its story, that I think it actively hurts the rest of the series going forward. Do you remember, back during the tutorial dungeon, when I mentioned that data Jin left with Kanan that purported to reveal the masterminds behind the Milshan conflict? Finally, on Old Milsha, in the heart of the UTIC organization's headquarters, we can decipher that data. This should be a huge, earth-shattering revelation. And how is it presented in-game? Jin talking to the party, completely deadpan. This is the most boring choice the director could have chosen, and because of that, the player isn't clued in as to how important what they're hearing really is. Though even if the game were to have presented this revelation in a better way, it wouldn't make much of a difference because of the game's failure to effectively establish the identity of the organization revealed to be at the center of everything, the Immigrant Fleet. For those who need a bit of a refresher, the Immigrant Fleet is one of the major factions in Xenosaga's universe. A society built around an ancient form of Christianity, the fleet was the first large-scale migration group to leave the Earth after the activation of the Zohar made that region of space uninhabitable. They took the Zohar with them, colonizing an area of the universe completely outside the sphere of influence of the Galaxy Federation. Whereas the Federation resembles modern democratic systems, the society of the immigrant fleet is more akin to a theocracy, and the two entities have engaged in periodic conflicts, and sometimes all-out wars, over the past few centuries. If you're wondering when, in Episode 2, this is all explained, it kind of isn't. 
I pulled a lot of it from the Japan-exclusive side story Xenosaga Pied Piper, as well as from Episode 3. Aside from a few cursory mentions, the immigrant fleet is left weirdly unintroduced in Episode 2, and this makes any potential revelations involving them feel completely hollow. Take, for instance, what I assume was meant to be another huge reveal, the moment when the party discovers the Patriarch with the Zohar. The notion that the Utic organization is more or less a cover for the immigrant fleet should be a major twist. The only problem with this is that in one of the game's first cutscenes, we see Margulis and the Patriarch having a conversation, so there's no way this twist could have meant anything. The incompetence continues with the revelation that both Utic and the Immigrant Fleet are both covers for the secret society known as Ormus. This is something that, again, was probably meant to be a major twist, but literally could not have been, because the party has already traversed through a dungeon that's canonically referred to in-game as the Ormus Stronghold. Everything about this scene is so badly done, it actually loops around and becomes impressive. And I haven't even touched on Xion yet, because her role in the scene is somehow the worst part of the whole thing. Remember the scene in Episode 1, when your party meets the Realian named Fibronia? Xion has some sort of relationship with Fibronia, though at that point we aren't really sure to what extent, and she asks her and the party to set her sisters, Cecily and Kath, free. Again, in the moment, we don't know what she means. Well, here we find out. Her sisters have been repurposed as control programs for the Zohar, and when she finds out, Xion has a complete breakdown. But why? Yes, what's become of Cecily and Kath is nothing short of horrifying, but I would argue that doesn't justify Xion's behavior. The game seems to suggest it has something to do with her past relationship with Fibronia and her sisters, but we aren't yet privy to the details of that relationship, and we won't be until the middle of Episode 3. Did Arai and Yonasaka forget what the audience does and does not know at this point in the story? I have no idea, but either way, nothing about this scene. This entire portion of the game, if I'm being honest, is done well, and as a result, the most crucial details of Xenosaga's lore are introduced in the most ineffective and confusing way possible. The rest of the series simply cannot recover from such a misstep. To be fair though, even if this portion of the game were better directed, its presentation would still fall flat on its face, and to explain why, we need to talk about the game's voice acting. For reasons unclear, Kevin Seymour and Anime Studios were not asked to return to dub Episode 2. Instead, Namco chose Cup of Tea Productions, a studio who most of you will probably know at least somewhat well. They've been Namco's go-to dub outfit for their main RPG franchise, the Tales of series, since Tales of Legendia released in the US in 2006, but they've also made a name for themselves with their dubs of Fire Emblem and Nier. Xenosaga Episode 2 was the first project the studio worked on, and perhaps because of that inexperience, the game's dub is bad. Part of that is due to the fact that many actors from Episode 1 were replaced. Thankfully they didn't get rid of everyone. We still get to hear Dave Wittenberg play Alan, Brianne Sedell play Junior, Richard Epcar play Ziggy, Michael McConaughey play Margulis, Kirk Thornton play Matthews, and most importantly, Crispin Freeman play Guinan and Albedo. Everyone else though? New actors. I admittedly don't know the logistics of how voice actors are hired for their roles, more specifically why Cup of Tea couldn't just rehire everyone from Episode 1, given they already have experience with those characters. All I can do is speak as a fan who's heard the dub, and as a fan, it feels really, really weird to hear so many of these new voices. And honestly, most of those voices seem like the store brand knockoffs to Episode 1's name brands. Henry Dittman sounds enough like Tony, but whenever he spoke, I couldn't help but think, this isn't Tony Oliver. Allie Hillis's Mary falls in and out of her southern accent as the game progresses. I'm not going to say that Wendy Lee's accent in Episode 1 was immaculate or anything, but at the very least, her usage of it was consistent. I could make similar comments about every other replacement actor. The only one who's arguably an improvement is Joshua Seth as Chaos. His calm, melancholic delivery suits the character well. As anyone who's seen my video on Episode 1 will attest to, I'm a huge fan of Kevin Seymour and Animaze's work, so I understand if this comes across as a fan upset that his favorite studio wasn't asked to continue their work but I sincerely believe there's a qualitative difference between the two dubs that can probably be chalked up to Cup of Tea's inexperience. The delivery of almost every character seems bizarrely sedate and unemotive, making it very hard for the player to connect with any of them on any sort of emotional level. This isn't true of the entire game, 
They did a good job on most of the flashback scenes concerning Junior, Albedo, and Guinan, which is impressive given those characters are all children. But those scenes are very much the exception. Most of the acting just bored me to tears. That leads me to the biggest problem with this new dub. The new voice actresses replacing Xion and Cosmos. I'll start with Cosmos, as her role is nowhere near as extensive in this game as Xion's is. To replace Bridget Hoffman, Cup of Tea chose Colleen O'Shaughnessy, who's become the voice of Tails in the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise since 2014. Compare this scene with episode 1, which I still find haunting every time I hear it. Protection of military personnel is not part of my prime directive. That's no excuse! You have no right to go about killing people! Why did you shoot Lieutenant Virgil? With your power, you don't have to sacrifice anyone to- At that time, Lieutenant Virgil was in my direct line of fire. Any changes in my firing position to avoid Lieutenant Virgil while protecting you would have resulted in a 30% depreciation in my offensive capabilities. On the other hand, with the Lieutenant's death, there would only be a 0.2% drop in efficacy. I simply chose the option with the highest probability to keep you alive. To this one from episode 2. You really saved us. Thank you very much. I am happy to be of service. Not even in the same universe. O'Shaughnessy reminds me of a 12-year-old girl who doesn't want to be in math class. This completely destroys any sense of mystery or terror about Cosmos, which are kind of her two defining character traits. But again, compared to episode 1, Cosmos isn't in the game very much, so her performance is easy enough to ignore. The same cannot be said for Xion. Replacing Leah Sargent, one of the most talented voice actresses ever to work in the industry, would not be an easy task regardless of who they picked, but their choice could not have been worse. They decided to go with Olivia Hack. This is a name that most of you probably don't know, but if you're like me and grew up watching Nickelodeon in the 1990s, then you'll recognize her as the voice of consummate rich bitch Rhonda Lloyd from Hey Arnold. If you think that's a strange choice, then we're on the exact same page. And there's no way for me to say this in a nice way, so I'm not even gonna try. She does a terrible job. The role is absolutely out of her depth. She cannot hit any of the requisite emotional notes necessary to play the character. In some scenes, she sounds exactly like Rhonda Lloyd. Wait a minute, Jin. Not this again. I've already told you I'm not going to their graves. But don't you know who I am? I'm a Lloyd, and Lloyds have been attending not to mention donating money to this academy for generations. When she's told of the problems surrounding Momo's UMN analysis, she sounds like the yes guy from The Simpsons. Oh no, poor Momo. I had a stroke! Her worst moment, however, is when the party discovers Cecily and Kath at the Zohar. Xion, what is that? It's horrible. It's horrible! I can't stand this! I'm, I'm sick of all this! I just... I can't take it anymore! I just can't! Ugh. Now, as this video has already shown, that scene has about a million other problems outside of the voice acting, but a top-tier performance from Xion is absolutely essential for it to have any hope of being held together, and the first time I watched it, I actually started laughing. Xion ruins almost every scene she's in because Hack has nowhere near the amount of competence to play her. It's an absolutely atrocious performance in every sense. So, at this point, we're at the end of the game, and I've got very little to add, which is fine since I've already said a lot. And honestly, I'm not taking any joy in the fact that I have this much to say. I mean, this script is already over 12,500 words, which is several thousand words longer than my script for episode 1, and believe me, I'd much prefer to have more to say about that game than this one. With that in mind, some of you may be wondering why I didn't just address some of those developmental problems in that video, since many of them began when Monolith Soft was creating episode 1. The short answer to that is, I didn't have to. Xenosaga Episode 1 may have been plagued with a story too ambitious for its own good, and a creative team not equipped to block that story out realistically, but the final product was so confidently delivered that a player could completely ignore them, or, like me, not even realize they were there. Xenosaga Episode 2 doesn't give you that luxury. 
Its problems are so pronounced, so widespread in every aspect of the game, that the player is forced to come to terms with them, so that's what I had to do. But perhaps the saddest thing about all this is that despite all of its problems, I can still see traces of the game this could have been. Every so often, what seems like glimpses of Takahashi and Tanaka's original vision still manage to shine through all the darkness. The scene where Albedo learns he's condemned to immortality and will be forced to outlive the brothers he loves so much is heartbreaking, as is Junior and Albedo's final confrontation at the very end of the game. And the endgame cutscenes revealing Abel's arc and hinting at Chaos's true identity were fantastic cliffhangers. One that made me excited for what was coming, even though at that point I had no reason to be. I admit that I'm an optimist at heart, but when I saw those scenes, I genuinely felt my hope rekindle. I felt that, even if the series is cut back to only three games instead of six, even if the series only covers the story of Xi'an and her party, even if the second game was such a disaster, the third game could still be great. That it could be a fitting conclusion to what was still one of the most ambitious stories in the history of video games. Whether or not it was, is the story for my next video.